Hello Explorers, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and on today's Web DM, Hexual Maps. Hex oh, we're getting Hexual What's today. your Hexual Orientation? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> there it is. What the hell is a hex crawl? All right. like what, some people seem to be confused, apparently. There's, yeah, there is some confusion around hex crawls, and we have got a lot of requests for this one, by the way, so yeah. this is for y'all. They've seen a bit of a resurgence, and for a while, the hex crawl as a mode of play was seen as sort of antiquated or, or mm -hmm. you know, just like, oh, it's what they did in the bygone eras when, yeah. you know, there was a different subsystem for everything. A relic of, a, of, of gaming that no longer is relevant, but has it's retro, come man. back. It's retro, It's yeah. retro, But it's come back into resurgence partly because of the OSR, I think, and partly because it's a useful tool. And this is something that I'd like to get out of the way before we do anything else about hex crawls. All right, I'm braced. Hex crawl is a tool of play. It is not a fucking identity that you assume. And when you go online, much like sandboxes, much like railroading, much yeah. like min-maxing and multi-classing and power gaming, when you see these discussions play out online, there's all these like standard bearers are mustered and the lines mm -hmm. are drawn and everybody's going to get into a big ass fight about it. A hex crawl is a tool. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is appropriate to use a hex map and have the characters journey across uh, an environment in a game game fashion. Sometimes a narrative approach where you montage the journey is acceptable. Mm -hmm. And every iteration in between, there's point crawls, there's the journey mechanic from Adventures in Middle Earth where it's more elaborate and it's about like how the journey begins, the things you encounter on it, and the state of your condition when you end the journey. Yeah. You know, there's all of these different ways. We're just talking about one way here. And a hex crawl is a type of gaming. It's a tool for a dungeon master to use, but it is not for everyone, it is not for every table, and it is not for every time the players want to go from point A to point B. Right. That's the thing to get out of the way first off. So a hex crawl is an attempt to make a game out of journeying long distances and the movement from one hex to another. And it's a hex because that means you can go diagonal, you can go northeast, northwest, and sort of the, the inner area of the hex from, from side to side is all going to be the same, it's as opposed to a grid yeah. where, depending on where you're moving within the grid, you might not always be moving the same distance. It's an attempt to make a game out of that. Yeah. and to trigger a series of procedures whenever the group enters one hex from another that rolls for getting lost, random encounter checks, uh, to see if they find one of the interesting hex descriptions that the dungeon masters come up with. A way of keeping track of time and distance and movement in an era when it when it grew up, tracking all those things was very important, right? Like, this is the era of play when the Mega Dungeon was popular. We can imagine something like Castle Greyhawk or, or one of the other earlier Mega Dungeons. There is a need for a wilderness of some kind. What happens when the party is not in town, regrouping, resupplying, hiring mm -hmm. new uh, retainers, and they're not in the dungeon exploring, you know, getting around traps, pulling out treasure. There's the land between that. There's the land between that. And so the original Hex Crawl was a game called Outdoor Survival, and it was a more mundane, you know, you're basically playing like backpackers in a very random yeah. environment that's got like forests and deserts <laughs> and mountains all right next to each other, and it's a separate character sheet that you sort of transfer stats from your D and D character sheet to outdoor survival. I have played it, and the times that I have, my character always died. So <laughs> that was so, <laughs> so the what three times that my original D and D character died. Two of them were on hex crawls. So just don't go on the hex crawl. Well, we had to because <laughs> yes. in order to get to the oracle who would identify our magic items, it was a ten day trip out into the wastes. Ah. And so when we needed to make a trip, we would get the outdoor survival game. We would put the board down, move our little chits across the hex map. Mm -hmm. and keep track of our food, rations, uh, whether we got lost or not, on a separate character sheet. So that's like the original version of it. Yeah. Those procedures of play make it into later versions of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, eventually, a group known as Judges Guild, they produce something known as the Wilder Lands of High Fantasy, starting with City State of the Invincible Overlord. And the campaign hex system that they used for that was very worked out. There were nested encounter tables that you would use. You'd roll on a master table and then there'd be a bunch of sub tables after that. And you knew that every hex on that hex map, you could zoom in on it and then it would be a miniature hex map itself. So yeah. you could keep zooming in on the hexes until you got to something where it's like each hex is, you know, 200 feet across or something yeah. like that. You're like zooming in down to like a village map level. Uh, the hex has got hexes, man. 
Yes, exactly. The entire hex map for Wilder Lands of High Fantasy is about the size of the Mediterranean surrounding lands, and so it's this big open world that has all of these descriptions, and a lot of times, uh, at least whenever I first encountered hex maps, the Wilder Lands of High Fantasy was sort of set aside as like the perfect ideal of what a hex crawl should be. I've played a couple of games in Wilder Lands and they're very fun and it's useful to have uh, the hex map there. There are other products now out there that, actually there's a ton of products out there right now that describe various hex maps and hex crawls and any number of them would be uh, useful in detailing your own hex map. But mm -hmm. this idea that there's a game to be had out of the journeying between places. That there's game procedures that trigger when the players move a certain distance, that you're keeping track of time. All of these things are components of the hex map, and, and or sorry, the hex crawl, and you don't, uh, you know, you don't really get that, the same kind of experience if it's just like, the Dungeon Master sort of describes you traveling through the location. Maybe you have the one encounter that's, that's uh, you know, an example of what you might find in that location, and then you get to your destination. Mm -hmm. That's like one way of doing journeys. Hex crawl is just another way of doing them. Our DMs out there want to make their own hex, hex yeah, map, right? Yeah, some practical information, sure. So, how big are your hexes? <laughs> like, I, like when you're making your map, <laughs> you're like, you're looking at all these hexes, like how big is that one, should that first hex be before yep. they start going layers deep? And, gotcha. And we, <laughs> they start incepting this shit. Well, I, I don't necessarily advocate for like in, in hexing your hexes, and I usually stick with one hex map when I do these. I, I just don't have that much time. In hexing, we need to look <laughs> right. that up later. I think that's the one I made up. Yeah. So, but how big an individual hex is, is gonna determine a lot of things. My preference is for some number that it's related to how far a player can travel in a day, yeah. unencumbered or just sort of like whatever their base movement Yeah, normal pace. I don't like hex crawls themselves that feature like one hex equals a day's worth of travel. My, I personally don't like that because it makes progress across the map feel like glacially paced. So my preference is, is if say the party can move 24 miles in a day, then I, I will do an eight mile hex. So that's three hexes a day that they can move. That yeah. gives them some operational mobility, gives them a sense of progress as they're moving through the map. Mm -hmm. But I've seen hex crawls that go one mile hexes, six mile hexes. Right, right. Uh, and in a lot of ways, it's how much of a larger hex map do you want to have to deal with? Mm -hmm. If you're using a program like Hexographer or Hex Kit, then it's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you in terms of like actually making the thing. I like that because you know you're moving through more hexes, so that's more opportunities for the players to get lost and right. to start going the wrong direction. Just start going Supposed the wrong to just like oh here oh well then we just need to go this way then. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit more granular, and I like somewhere uh, around like eight, sometimes six is mm -hmm. what I'll use. Use, uh, depending on how far a party can move in a day. Right, right. But I, I don't necessarily like the ones that are like, this is a mile, and then they're just snaking all over the map. That might be appropriate for a very small area, right? Yeah, you're just in a small valley taking care of things. So let's just go with, with your standard here, eight miles to a hex. So how big should you make your map? Well, that's, starting out. Right, that's, an, that's another one. And so if you want like uh, an, an area of play that the party has a lot of room to wander around in, and it feels big. It feels like a place that they can get lost in, a place that they can find all sorts of adventure and there's a lot there's a lot of room for other things to be going on without necessarily bumping into a, you know a crowded map is sometimes a problem where it's like yeah, there's too much going on in here. Yeah, there's just too much going on. My preference is is that they would if they were in the center of the map, they could walk in any direction for a week and still be on the map. That's yeah. just a practical you know, rule of thumb that I have for myself. Mm -hmm. In truth, the map is as big as it needs to be. And I think like continent-sized big hex maps are less useful than area hex maps. Yeah. To give you an example, the hex map that's in Princess of the Apocalypse, while there is some wonkiness with how big the hexes are and how far they can travel, that size of an area right. is probably like the smallest that I would go. Mm -hmm. Um, but you could go, like I said, up to where, you know, if they walk within, um, a week. For, you know, a week in any Now we're talking business week or full week? Seven days? I'm talking about seven days, okay. not a ten day. Um, so we're, so now we're talking about a map that is 43 by 43 hexes, if you include the center hex. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
So that's a pretty substantial that's a, map. That's a pretty substantial map. And what you'll find is that that's a lot of hexes, right? Yeah. Like those are a lot of individual hexes that you have. The intimidation starts to creep in. This is, you know, this is the deep prep phase of a campaign. Mm -hmm. You're prepping the hex map. You're coming up with descriptions of things. You're world building. You might not know what characters the party has made yet. You might not even have a, an adventuring party yet at all. You're just sort of creating something that will one day see play. That's really big. And so I might divide that into quadrants or, or zoom in on a on a particular locality and then feature a, a you know a second hex map for that the standard of sort of they can walk a, a week in any direction is more of a convenient stake for me so that I don't have to make a whole bunch of these hex maps <laughs> without knowing like okay they're headed off in this direction I've got some time to, to make a new one it's a big empty map yeah and and you need you need stuff in it. You need so stuff in it. where do you start as far as stocking your hex map? I mean, is it natural landmarks? Is it man-made or dwarf or elven made, mm -hmm. you know, landmarks? Is it is it is it cave systems? I mean, where do you start? Rivers, mountains? I mean, the geography of the place is I will, you know, sort of roughly sketch that out. Sometimes you'll draw a regular map by hand and then lay a hex grid over that. Some, mm -hmm. Like if you're using one of the hex kits, one of the free uh, software programs like Hexographer or Hex Kit, they do have paid versions, but they also have like a free promo version as well. Then a lot of that is done for you. You're just like every hex has an icon in it that tells you what the terrain features are in there. But some people like to have a map that's more organic feeling or more, um, you know, just th that's not as artificial as like everything in this hex is this one type of terrain. It's a hex map, which means it's a map, which means it's not the terrain itself. It's a representation of it, right? So that even if you're in a forest hex, there's going to be some variety there, things like that. But I'll block out the major landscape features. Um, I will put anything that can be spotted from a distance and isn't otherwise hidden on the map that I'm going to give to players. So that might have icons for prominent ruins or towers or villages or locations and things. And I'm not necessarily, it's, it's the big stuff on the, the big map that I prepare. And then as they explore individual hexes, we'll go into detail and sort of zoom in on that hex and say like, okay, well, this is here. And they'll find this automatically or, or they'll have to look for this other feature. Once the geography is done, yeah. And there's a ton of different approaches to that. You can do a very naturalistic type of geography, or you can do a type of geography that's more impressionistic, like I want a river here, just because I want a river here, even though the mountains are on the wrong side. Or and it would be flawed. It should flow this way. <laughs> it should be flowing this way. I decided flow. not to. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know that I ever actually take that into account. Every now and again I do, but... Yeah, I, I know we've kind of talked about it before uh, on, on maybe one of the DM tip shows, but... Some people get really obsessive about their maps, and other people is just like, eh, it is what it is. We hey, the, the Nile flows north, so right. that's what I'm saying. is not everything <laughs> adheres to this conventional true. standard or whatever. Right. You've got your blank hex map, maybe you've got the broad strokes of your geography on it. You've got your rivers, a couple of prominent landmarks. But you need, like, this thing to be a practical place for the players to play in. It needs to have stuff for them to adventure. Otherwise, they're just walking around in the woods, right? Right, they're just wandering around, and that gets old pretty quickly. You really only need about three hexes to start with. And uh, there's a blog that I follow, Chicago Wizard. Uh, he's got a podcast, The DM's Handbook, that, that's rather handy. Uh, appropriately enough. Uh, and then his blog has a lot of what he calls uh, the three hex rule, which is that in order to start a hex crawl, all you need is three hexes. A home base is your home base, and then three interesting locations nearby, a hex adjacent to the home base, or like within two hexes of it. And they can be dungeon sites. They can be locations of other uh, settlements that are perhaps have a rivalry with the home base. They can just be interesting locations that something's going on. But it provides three options for the players. Perhaps those three hexes are linked in some way. Maybe they're just separate and the only thing in common they have is sort of proximity to each other. But it's three locations that the players can visit and it gives you enough for the players to be like, well, we're kind of interested in this, we're kind of interested in that, it gives them some options, and as they explore around, you gradually expand out from this one hex and the surrounding ones. As they explore, you sort of just expand your hex map. If you're starting on, say, the middle hex, you don't need to know what's way out over here. Yeah, what's two weeks away? Right. You need to know what's within a day's journey of where the party is and link your adventures to the locations that are in those hexes so that they have a reason um, to go there. Right. So that's it. We'll provide some uh, some links for that so you can visit uh, Chicago Wizards' blog. And I, like I said, I encourage you to check out his uh, podcast because it's very, uh, very useful. The next big step is filling your hex map with stuff, 
making yeah. it come alive. Yeah. This is where I look to the Wilder Lands of High Fantasy system that Judges Guild put out, and, and that master table that they have is filled with things like ruins and lairs and small dungeons and wizard's towers and castles and villages and sites of interest and, you know, former battlegrounds. The nested sort of encounter tables that are there with the master encounter table and the sub tables provide you with a system for coming up with hex descriptions on the fly yeah. should you need it. Some of the hexes will be pre-described. It's like, I know what's in this hex. There's a village there. This guy's the leader of the village. It's has this many people in it, etc. But sometimes they wander into a, a hex where you have no idea what's there because you haven't taken the time to detail what it is. And a, a good uh, random table will tell you what you might find in that hex. And uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's one of those things where if you look at a blank hex map and you go to like all those PDFs that you might have lying around, all those old adventures that you never used, all that prep stuff that the players never got to, this is where you start mining all of that. Yeah. That humble bundle you got earlier this year with like 40 something PDFs on it, there's probably something in there you can put on your hex map. Mm -hmm. That village you came up with a, a year ago that the party blew right past and, and didn't look at anything. Never asked which, anyone's name. Never names. asked anyone's name. Just scratch, change a couple of things, use that one. And the longer you're a game master, I know we have a lot of viewers who are new game masters. They're new to Dungeons and Dragons. They, they don't have that store of material they've created themselves and stuff that they've picked up over the years. Then you'll have to go out and search for those things. But if you're the kind of player who keeps, or kind of dungeon master who keeps everything, doesn't let anything go, and, and I, I wouldn't, it's all useful material, then this is where you start finding appropriate things to put in your hex map. You go, you know, this whole adventure right here that I've got, that's in this hex. Yeah. And when the party gets there, I will break out this adventure and have it adapted for the setting and, and the circumstances that the players uncover it. But like, I know that in that hex is this adventure. You can do this for every one of those hexes. It's a lot of work, right? <laughs> you can't, and I've seen settings out there where they have multiple descriptions per hex. Mm -hmm. And there's literally, you don't need to do any work other than read the hex descriptions and make it work for your table. And then there's other forms of, of hex crawls where you just have the highlights that are already detailed and the spaces in between you use the random procedures for to generate encounters and, and interesting sites and things that happen while they're there. You're gonna want a, a table for weather to detail the weather effects that are going on, or at least a yeah. procedure in place for determining what the weather is like at any given time. Yeah, because that's gonna be a big effect on how fast they can move, thus you know, yes. movement through the hex. Thus movement through the hex. And there are times where your players might not make it through an entire hex that they don't have enough, uh, their movement rate is insufficient to get them through the one mile, six mile, eight miles, 24 miles, whatever it is uh, mm -hmm. through the hex. In those cases, it's just like any other game of Dungeons and Dragons. They camp for the night. They, you know. Yeah. The, the hex is a, is a game tool, not necessarily have anything related to do with, uh, you know, what's going on in the actual game world. Right, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is just a, an elaborate mapping gaming tool to figure out where you're going. Right, um, right, right. There are obviously can be pitfalls Mm -hmm. To hex maps. Yeah. What could that be uh, other than, you know, the obvious, which is there's just nothing to do. <laughs> you uh, just, the, the you have like three things <laughs> and they decided to don't go left and you're standing there like. Not having something to do is, is one of the major ones. And yeah. for the types of hex crawls that just feature like, okay, we've, we know it's in this hex because it's sort of the highlight and then we have a lot of empty space in between. Uh, that can happen if you're not ready for it or if the the procedural tools that you have at your disposal are insufficient to create uh, you know a, a lot of interesting encounters then you will struggle and you might find that yeah this isn't very interesting that's mm -hmm. when you realize that this particular tool might not be for your table and you go back to the drawing board and, and find another way of, of, of gaming out long journeys over great distances or short distances or whatever. But you can avoid some of those things by when you make a hex description, making sure that they don't have to go searching around for the fun and for the interesting parts of the game. And so if you've got, say, a feature in the hex crawl, maybe it's a, an ancient ruin that holds some treasure that you want the party to find, or it's a bandit camp, that the party has a, a possibility of running across the bandits, but if they track them down to their camp, they might be able to rescue some people or something. My advice to you is to make one feature of your hex 
uh, obvious and automatically found. You know, whatever it is, whether they spot the smoke from the bandit camp, they see bandits in the distance going off into the woods and, and know that at least someone is in there and, and perhaps residing there. Uh, maybe they meet someone on the road who's like, oh yeah, be careful around here. There's a bandit camp in those woods over there. Yeah. They, they like to accost travelers. You make it obvious and immediate that there's something in this location, something nearby, that could be of interest to the party. Whether it's their objective entirely, like they're going out and searching for these bandit camps, or this bandit camp is just an obstacle on the way for them to get to whatever it is that they're going. Uh, you make at least one of those descriptions obvious and you tell the players, this is a thing that's here for you to check out. The other ones can be hidden if yeah. you want. And I recommend two to three items of interest per hex. We're now talking about like hundreds of items of interest that you would have to come up with, which is why random tables are so important. Mm -hmm. They're a way to supplement and spur your creativity onward when you're like, yeah, I really don't know that I can come up with like 600 interesting things for the party to do in this little map that I made. Well, there's tools out there and, and random tables. Yeah. And this is why there's a master table for whether or not there's a dungeon in this hex. And then if it's a dungeon, what sort of dungeon is it? And how big is that dungeon? You take something like Tales of the Yawning Portal and you're like, well, I need a first level dungeon. I'm gonna take like 10 rooms out of the Sunless Citadel yeah. and, and use that map and maybe some change up some of the monsters that are in it. And boom, all of a sudden you have a different dungeon to throw in there. Mm -hmm. Keeping it interesting, keeping it engaging and not making the players jump through too many hoops to find the things that will hold their interest and give them something to do. Some things are hidden. Players like discovering things. You know, they like the sense of, of, of discovery and of, of following clues that lead to something else. DMs like it when their secrets are discovered because they put a lot of work into these things and they, right. they go through the time and effort to craft these worlds and they want to show them off. So I wouldn't make them jump through too many hoops to find the interesting thing that's in your hex. And you can also make sure that it's not boring by just making the locations and the things that are in them fantastic. There's a tendency amongst some DMs to make their games mundane and to make the, the adventures that happen in them and the things that happen in them very mundane and just sort of, it, it, that's occasionally okay, yeah, yeah. right? That's occasionally all right for there to be a, a problems with tax collecting going yeah. on in your in your adventure. I see a lot of times that there's a, a tendency to like go too far in the opposite direction and go like, well, this is a very normal, yeah. real place and they worry about food and taxes and all this other stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but where's the fantastic in it? Yeah. Where is the wondrous, yeah. the awe-inspiring, the weird, yeah. the, the, the zany, the... Well, we're worried about food, but it's, <sighs> it's griffin meat. That's why it's fantastic. Okay, so you go and hunt griffins. What does that look like? How, that seems like a big endeavor. Mm -hmm. You know, Gotta go up <laughs> in the mountains, find them up there. By the way, griffin omelets are incredible, so yeah. it's worth the effort. Find some griffin eggs. Absolutely worth the, effort. <laughs> worth the effort. Returning again to sort of like, what are the pitfalls? We've got uh, just a monotonous, boring play. Mm -hmm. And you see this sometimes as it relates to the official Wizards of the Coast hex crawls that, that they've put out. Because one of the common complaints about Out of the Abyss is that there's only 20 entries on this encounter table. We're gonna be traversing the Underdark for 15 levels and we've only got 20 encounters here, you're clearly going to have to do more work if you're running a game like Out of the Abyss to give yourself more to do. But then the whole point of buying a pre-published adventure is that you don't have to do, to do a ton of work. work to make it work. Right, and how many how many times can you go come across the 1d4 carrion crawlers right. before you're like, Really, yeah. We've already killed all the carrion crawlers in the underdog. Yeah, how many of them are there? And you see the same thing with like Tomb of Annihilation where people are like, oh yeah, the jungle part of it is like, it's another hex of jungle filled with zombie dinosaurs. It's another hex of jungle filled with zombie dinosaurs. And when you're playing in something like fifth edition and every day that the party wakes up after a long rest, they are refreshed anew with mm -hmm. All, everything they could possibly need to <laughs> face an encounter and they're gonna face one every three or four days. Yeah. And so these combat encounters become boring, become monotonous, they become low stakes or no stakes. Yeah. And the players start to check out and the dungeon master gets bored with prepping the same adventure multiple times in a row. And they're just like, why in the world don't we just get to the lost city of temple snake people, whatever, and yeah. get this over with? 
Yeah, they just want to die, but they know if they do, they're going to get sucked into the soul monger. They're going to sucked into, they're going to get their soul monged. That's Don't a monger my soul, bro. <laughs> that's a problem. And when I see, when I read people on the internet or, or in blogs or forums and they're like, hex crawls suck, they're stupid, players hate them, and then they use the Wizards of the Coast examples as what a hex crawl is, I go, yeah, that those sound boring. They they don't sound fun. And I there's a reason why I did not run out of the abyss as a hex crawl. Yeah. There's a reason why when you guys were journeying through the Underdark, I used narrative. And I was just like, you guys spend 30 days traveling through tunnels and caves. What do you guys do for 30 days traveling through tunnels and caves? Mm -hmm. And maybe there's an encounter if it's... if. if I have other criteria for when encounters yeah. come in, in sort of narrative journey. But it was a lot of mushroom soup. A lot of mushroom soup and a lot of just, you know, it's tough. Um, <laughs> contrast that with Curse of Strahd. Curse of Strahd is a very small location. Yeah. The hexes there are very small. You can journey across the entire map in just a couple of days. And in that sense, like the random encounters there are tight, they're focused, mm -hmm. they're thematic for the setting itself. Uh, it's not that the encounters in Out of the Abyss or, or Storm King's Thunder or Tome of Annihilation are any less, uh, yeah, they're still the same. It's just it worked for Curse of Strahd because there was this theme going on and, and because you didn't, you weren't stuck for like five or six sessions in a row doing the same thing. Which I have heard about for from Tomb of Annihilation, where people just get stuck in the jungle and the places the places of interest are too far apart, and it's not clear how you get there. In between is just the same terrain and the same monsters, and people are bored. Mm -hmm. um, you vary those up by having different monsters, different terrain. You have variable terrain features, and if you ever want to know what to stock your hex with, hex crawl map with, go take a walk in the real world. If your hex crawl is eight miles across, try to find the time to take a four mile walk or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Find a location near you that's, that's a natural setting and just go for a walk for two hours and realize like that there's a variety of terrain probably, unless you're in one of those places where it's like, no, it really is all the same. Like no we live way. in the desert, so it's just all desert. <laughs> You've been to West Texas, bro? <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, I have. Flat uh, and wind. <laughs> Those are the two features Those of my two features crawl. of it. We got dust and wind. So it's not that there are, you know, there are going to be times where monotonous terrain is present. Yeah. And in those cases, you just say like, oh yeah, it's more desert. Unless there's something that's going on with the terrain. And to be honest, fair is fair, the terrain encounters in Out of the Abyss I thought were a great idea. And I, it's one of those things about Out of the Abyss that I will then incorporate into future hex crawls where it's like, oh, this is an encounter that features the terrain heavily. Something that's exemplary of the type of terrain that you're in. For a desert, it might be a sudden and quick sandstorm of some kind that mm -hmm. comes along or a particular stretch of desert that's difficult to traverse because the sand is shifting and loose and whatever. But that might- Quicksand. Mm -hmm. Could be quicksand. It might conceal, that quicksand might be uh, emptying into a hidden dungeon that's slowly being uncovered. And the, the character lost to the quicksand really just finds themselves in an empty cavity uh, you know, in a room somewhere uh, as they fall through the ceiling onto a pile of sand and they're like, well, crap, now I'm <laughs> down here and <laughs> we need to figure out what to do. And Those are you're in a library <laughs> with a giant owl. Uh, don't take any books. You can break up the monotony by having them find an, finding an interesting location that they can explore for a while. Right. A small ruin or a, an abandoned uh, structure of some kind. Place that they can go. Maybe they'll learn something important about uh, a quest that they have or, or something that while they're there, a clue to what's around them. Maybe it's an old monster lair or something that they're going into. That doesn't even touch on what on the creatures that might be there. Yeah. The the types of inhabitants that are going to be in your hex map. You want to choose monsters that are evocative of your setting and try to avoid filler monsters, right? Try to avoid the temptation to keep your uh, keep your encounter tables like level appropriate. You want to have dangerous monsters in there that the party's going to have to run away from or, mm -hmm. or just learn how to deal with. You might want really weak monsters in there that the players can just easily overcome because you want something else out of those, right? A handful of goblins isn't going to be much challenge to a party of even like fourth or fifth level characters. But you might throw them in there because they can reveal information about something or mm -hmm. the party can interact with them in some way. Not every encounter needs to end in combat. One of the things that I liked about, what I really like about older editions of Dungeons and Dragons is they have these rules for like, okay, 
How far away is the party from the monsters when they encounter each other? Are they aware of each other when they encounter them? That mutual surprise roll. What's the initial disposition of the, of the creatures that the party encounters? That's the initial reaction roll. And those things, visibility and encounter distance, um, the surprise roll, whether or not you surprise each other, and the reaction roll will determine the initial setup for that encounter. And the dice could go in your favor, and maybe you come across a group of evil humanoids that are just, they're fresh from a kill, and they're not looking to pick a fight, you know? Or maybe they're on some kind of diplomatic mission, and they're looking to make contact with people, and they're not really squabbling, they're not really looking for a, not really spoiling for a fight. Mm -hmm. um, that gives you certain options, right? And if you don't assume that every encounter the party faces will end in combat, you now have some variety in your combats. You now have some variety in your encounters. Maybe they meet uh, other travelers that can reveal information about the place. Maybe they meet, uh, you know, a, a monster that needs their assistance of some kind. Uh, maybe they don't meet anything, they just come across clues to something else, right? They see mm -hmm. the fresh kill of a wyvern that's, that's stalking the area, and now they know, okay, there's a wyvern out here, we need to watch the skies. Yeah. Or maybe they come across the trampled grass of a group of, of you know, step riders or something like that, and the party knows, okay, well, we gotta keep an eye out because there's a bunch of, you know, mounted bandits out there uh, that could come upon us fairly quickly. Having those kinds of things, foreshadowing the monsters that are out there, letting the players discover abandoned lairs, letting them discover old uh, combat and battle sites so that they could learn something, R rumors on the road about what might be out there. All of those things, when used in little dips and dabs and just a little bit here and there, sprinkled in with the occasional combat encounter, all this stuff creates the impression of a setting that's alive. Mm -hmm. that's living and breathing and reactive to the players and does things on its own when the players aren't there and breaks up the monotony of, okay, moving to the next hex, random encounter, it's another zombie T-Rex, let's, you know, roll initiative, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And those sorts of hex crawls are boring and they are not in an enjoyable experience and they fail at their task of bringing the journey to life which yeah. is the only reason we're here with a hex crawl in the first place. Right, right. So we wanted to brought to life. It's a beyond boring and monotonous play, which is probably the number one thing for, um, for a hex crawl. I, I, the slow pace of it, right? It, a lot of the times, if you've, particularly if you've got players that, you know, they're very involved with their characters, they want, to do, they want to do a lot of things, they want to describe what's going on. If you're doing like a hex by hex kind of situation, you might only get through two or three hexes a session. If they're the type of players to like uncover everything about a location, to really spend time places, they're covering up, they're brushing out crowbars and pulling up rocks and tearing down doors mm -hmm. and they want to find everything here, then you might have a very slow progression across your hex map. Maybe that's what you're in for, and you're there for the journey, not the destination. But that's not really my experience. And, and yeah. my experience has been that the destination is really the important part of this, and you use uh, something like a hex crawl just to highlight the environment, right? The whole point of, of the kind of play that uh, a hex crawl produces is that the pre-prepared location locations uh, and descriptions plus the random encounter tables create the story of the environment that you're playing in. And these emergent elements are, are why we're here. We don't, yeah. We're not predetermining too much other than like, there is a village over there, these are the people, that's what you'll find. And so that slow pace can sometimes be uh, accompanied by a lack of sense of accomplishment. You know, if you have very goal-oriented players, players who are really about getting to the objective, completing the quest, doing the thing, a slow progression across a bunch of hexes may just really turn them off and really make them feel like they're spinning their wheels and that nothing's happening, particularly if you're using like experience points and they're in the middle of one of those levels that it takes a ton of experience points to get through and mm -hmm. they're like, I haven't leveled up in a while and we've been doing the same thing three sessions in a row and I'm ready to get to the dungeon and get to fighting and, and get to solving these problems. Maybe you just don't have a player or a group of players that like a hex crawl and you try it out a couple of times and you go, eh, it's not for me. We're going to do yeah. something different. That kind of dovetails into just having motivated players. Sometimes players are, they, they're just not very well motivated. Yeah. And I, I'm really, 
sympathetic to that because there are so many things that go into why you would be motivated to when you sit down to play one of these games. What is it that you want to get out of the game? All of this stuff. You maybe had just a crap week and you don't want to have to think too much. You want to hang out with your friends, roll some dice, and kick some ass. Having your dungeon master go, okay guys, I really need you to dig deep and like think about this and like come up with some complex motivations and like mm -hmm. pick a directions for yourself and go, that's the recipe for a bad session. Yeah. And I, t I will tell you from personal and multiple experiences that handing the players a relatively blank map and going, guys, Look at all this blank space you could go explore. Isn't this fucking awesome? Yeah, you could go anywhere. You could go anywhere. And and the player's just going, I don't even know what to do with this. Yeah. And and it just it happened it's happened to me one too many times so that whenever I do a hex crawl now and I present a map to the players, it comes already prepared with points of interest. Yeah. And what I will have done is tied those points of interest into the character's background. The information the players are giving me, the goals that they want to accomplish, the things they want to achieve, mm -hmm. the significant events that are in their player backstory, I will do my best to start connecting them with places on that map so that I can point to them and go, that's the place this happened. Yeah. This is the place you learned that. That's that thing you're looking for. Once you start connecting things that the players care about with your map and the locations that are on it, you've now started to engage them. Yeah, their ears perk up a little right. bit. Right. You can't expect them all to be Lewis and Clark and want to just explore the great unknown until they find, you know, whatever it is they're looking yeah. for. <laughs> it's our manifest destiny. Right. When we get to the other side of this map. <laughs> In the name of the king. In the name of the king. There is a lot that goes into the preparation of a hex mm -hmm. map. We could talk probably for twice as long just about encounter tables alone. Why they're important for this style of play. How yeah. to use them effectively. I think encounter tables do have a bad reputation because people use them in poorly. And yeah. they, don't, they don't make use of that tool in a way that highlights its usefulness and why it makes the game fun. If you're interested in this style of play, if you're interested in you know, the hex crawl format, mm -hmm. the different procedures of play, it's worth digging deep and looking into it. We'll provide some links uh, in the uh, show description that kind of points you towards some of the resources that I find really helpful when creating hex crawls. There's a ton of information out here. Uh, for it, we've really just kind of scratched the surface on what you can do with these things. of undead unicorns is heading for Dundee. Fireballs and lightning. It is an amazing song. The sky. Yeah. Chaos around you while all the people die. In a court of vision of Dundee. Like okay. I really, I want to play the, I want to play that campaign. You should just call, you'd write a module. Okay, Glory Hammer, I have a question. Can I use your the song names to create a series of modules? You should, you would like ask them like, hey, I'd like to create a D and D campaign based on your album. Mm-hmm. Has this already been done? Has this already been done? Or can I get any pertinent information? You just call the sword and call a bunch of people and just be like, I'd like to make. Like to make oh, make the warp, really make the warp riders. Campaign? Yeah, I'd like to make the warp riders campaign with the three witches that you gotta go meet. And uh huh. 